Spread the haystack with Josh and Jesse. I'm Jesse. And I'm Josh. And this is a podcast all about saving the best and burning the rest. And we're going to start today with a Gregorian chant that we've been preparing just for this moment. <coughs> Take it away, Jesse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's early in the morning. It's not that early, but <laughs> I feel like it's early in the morning. Really. Yes, pre-coffee number two, so it's a yeah. dangerous time to record a podcast. Yes. But the reason we did that was not entirely random. Not entirely. <gasps> we are joining a monastery. No, we're not. no. I think that would be an interesting episode, but maybe another time. <laughs> Josh and Jesse go to a monastery. <laughs> I've recorded this live from a monastery. Man. Anyway, today we want to talk a bit about a book as a sort of prompt for this episode. And it's an awesome book. It is called Praying Like Monks, hence the Gregorian chant to start the episode off, and Living Like Fools by Tyler Staten. Hence us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. And yeah, it's obviously a book all about prayer. And I think we've mentioned it maybe once or twice on the show yeah. leading up to this, but I found this book super helpful and I thought it'd be an interesting prompt for, yeah, for a conversation. We put something in our little Burn the Haystack Facebook community about episodes that people would like to see. And one person shared that they were interested in prayer. And I thought, hey, what a great like starting point talking about this book. Yeah, so. fantastic. And look, I think it's something that a lot of us have had struggles with over the years. It's certainly a topic that I've struggled with in terms of my own personal prayer life. I have had ups and downs with my prayer journey, as have, I'm sure, most Christians. Mm. And when I read this book, it was, I think, Probably similar to you, Josh. Right place, right time. I needed it. And it was, yeah, incredibly helpful for me at the time. Mm. And I won't lead the witness in saying that our, our prayer lives are like 100,000 million times better as a result. But I think for me, this book helped me achieve a better foundation for my prayer life. So anyway, that's just my personal take on it, just to preface this discussion. Yeah, I feel like my, my prayer life has definitely improved as a result of this book. And change, just change shape. Like I just, it helped me make sense of a lot of things that I think, I, I had a lot of opinions on types of prayer and stuff and I think it helped me really think through those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there were a lot of things that I was just wanting to combat tradition and now I feel like, oh, like maybe the traditions were there for a reason and they're helpful. Mm. Yeah, so... Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. so that's where I'm coming at. Obviously, this conversation is no substitute for actually reading the book itself. Yeah. So it's not a big book, which is good. You can probably pick it up at Amazon. I think that's where I picked it up or mm. any good Christian bookshop. But yeah. it's a pretty easy read. I yeah. listened to it on Audible. And okay, it was great. Yeah. Sweet. And Tyler Staten, who... So just for those who don't know, Tyler Staten is the pastor at... Like the lead pastor at Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon. Had the opportunity to visit the church which was really cool oh, and got to you. meet him yep i was so like starstruck but <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he's also the leader of the 24 7 prayer ministries in the u.s yeah i'm not super familiar with the ministry itself it, it's so it's focused on prayer he didn't found it he's like the current director or whatever yep. as far as i'm aware I, what's it all about josh i think from my understanding of it yeah they're champions for just helping people to pray but also they set up these like prayer stations and stuff that are 24 7 so yeah. they actually set one up at bridgetown church yeah wow around easter so i think for for lent so like 40 days they just had this prayer room operating that was 24 7 okay and you could go in by yourself as a couple as a small group and they also had it booked out for the like the two hours or whatever the church is on for like their what they call the engine room team Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you, yeah, so I think I think it's Charles Spurgeon. When he would preach, he had a team of prayer warriors. I uh, sorry, mm. he'd call them the boiler room. Yeah, they were the boiler room. <laughs> the boiler room. So you know how like I don't know, like say you're on um so I don't this know. Is a, this is a train analogy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like a train is going, but it's going because of the energy that is 
and the fuel that's being made in the yeah. boiler room. That's where yeah. the energy's coming from. And so for him, he'd be up there preaching, but he'd have a group of people downstairs underneath praying for it the whole time. Ah, oh, so he's the, is it the conductor? That's probably not the right word. The pilot or the driver of the train, but the boiler room people, they're the ones that are actually helping to make it go. Yeah, maybe. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or maybe God's a conductor. Charles Spurgeon ah. is the train. And they're, the, they're the engine. Yeah, this, this analogy is getting stretched. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, but, uh, right. Anyway, but they do the same thing. So they have a team of people praying for the church service the whole time that the church service is on, like Got in it. another room, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, and they shared a bit about um, yeah how it works. So he shares, he shares it's like some stories of it in the book. It's worth reading, but I think... He was, when he first set one up, he was the first person in the room and they set it up with a little glass of wine and some bread for people to take communion while they're in there. And they cover the walls with like butcher paper kind of stuff that people can write on. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was the first one in there and he wasn't sure if it was going to take off or whatever because <laughs> he had to go on some trip. And so he was the first one in the room, signed, like wrote a little prayer thing that he did on the wall and left it. He came back after his like week-long trip, whatever, and it was just covered. Mm. Yeah, so pretty cool. Yeah, that is awesome. And when I was there in Portland, I was just like, I want to go to the prayer room. And it was totally booked out, like literally every hour of the day, like 1, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., totally booked out. That is pretty amazing. Yeah. I I have only been part of like a prayer room type situation once. Mm. And I can tell you right now, Josh, <laughs> I did not book out the 2 a.m. slot. <laughs> I think it was like the 9, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. slot. That's all I could hack. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's cool. Obviously, they have a, yeah, a relatively big church. It wasn't that big. They do two services and each would have probably oh, maybe four, 400 in there maybe. Yeah. Big, like big for Australia, maybe not so big for America, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but cool. So that was pretty cool to see them just so passionate about prayer. So anyway, so, I think that's what 24-7 Prayer Ministries, yes. I think that's their like big thing. Yeah, thing. yeah. But so the in the book, Tyler shares that that's not where prayer started for him. Prayer actually started for him. This surprised me because this is, I don't think, typical. Oh, I shouldn't say this isn't typical. It doesn't feel like it was typical for me when I was his age. He was a teenager and he... He was like 13. Like very young. Yeah, yeah. And he had this this burden for his school, I think, mm. uh, and he was just, I don't know, troubled or discontented or whatever with the spiritual scene at his school at the time mm. that he just decided that he was just going to pray and he just kept praying and praying and praying and I, I may be butchering some of the yeah. details of well, the story. I think his youth pastor challenged him. He was like, what do you reckon would happen if you prayed for your school right. every day? Yeah. And so he got the like yearbook with all their faces and names in it <laughs> and then he would He'd walk around the school, I think, every morning. That's six, right, yeah. 6 a.m., he'd walk around his, his little public yeah, school. like the walls of Jericho. <laughs> yeah, and just pray through all the names. And I'm like, man, what the heck? A 10-year-old does that. It's 6 yeah. a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And it's- he does this consistently for a while, and then he has some sort of prayer meeting on a Wednesday morning or mm. some worship Bible study type thing. And it's like really early in the morning. Yeah, and kids don't want to be up at that. I don't want to be up at that time. <laughs> yeah, even as an adult. Yeah. yeah. But because he has set this foundation of prayer for I don't know how long, quite a while, people start to, students, fellow peers of his start to come to this thing. Hmm. I just, it's crazy to think that a 13-year-old, number one, would take a challenge like that on. Yeah. The discipline that it requires is not something that I probably had at 13 years of age. No. But then number two, to do it consistently over Mm. time and for God to actually, I don't know if reward is the right word, but it's the way that he puts it is like prayer gets something going that doesn't happen if we don't pray. And it's, I really loved, I think the thing that I really loved is, I don't know if you saw this, Josh, but Tim Mackey, who does the foreword for this book, Mm. preached a message at, I think one of their conferences, it was at the church. Oh, cool. And he was talking about his journey with prayer, which is a bit different to Tyler's yep. journey with prayer because Tim didn't come onto it. By the way, Tim Mackey, Bible Project, if you don't know, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how you could not know Tim Mackey by well, this stage. I know, I if kind of, people listen to this podcast, <laughs> we, we talk about him a lot. Yeah. yeah, there's like free advertising for the Bible Project every <laughs> single week. Yep, yep. So he talks about how prayer is, I don't know if I want to go into it, Okay, I'll go into it. There's a story that there's a story that he tells about him hiking up in the mountains somewhere around mm. Portland. 
and he's running along this trail. He wants to get to the top of this mountain or this hill or whatever. He loves running. Another thing I don't get. But anyway, he is hiking along this trail and he sees this woman in the bushes. Very weird, very mm. random. And he assumes that she's using the bathroom. And so he he's like, oh, I'm not going to look. I'm going to leave her alone. I'm going to keep going. But then she calls out to him and says, hey, have you seen all the huckleberries? <laughs> now, number one, Josh, I didn't even know that a huckleberry was a real thing. I, no, thought I, thought it was, yeah. I just thought it was the name of that character yeah. from the Mark Twain novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Turns out a huckleberry is a real berry. Really? Apparently. Well, I didn't know this. This but. is the thing I keep finding about America. Like, <laughs> all these things that I thought were just in movies or whatever, they're real. <laughs> they're you know, real they things. actually have yellow school buses. When I was there, I was just like, Crazy. oh my goodness, they're a real thing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's not just Hollywood constructing this elaborate yeah. <laughs> panorama of the uh, fake America. So, yes, yeah, she calls out to him and says, hey, there's huckleberries everywhere. And he looks around this trail that he's been walking, hiking, running. And he realizes that the sides of the trail are covered in these huckleberry bushes that are in fruit. And apparently, again, I don't know what a huckleberry is necessarily, (laughs) apart from the fact that it's a type of berry, but he says that they only come into fruit very briefly in a season. So they're there one moment, then they're gone. And it just so happens that at the time, huckleberries were fruiting or whatever, they were coming into, they were ripe and this woman was just gorging herself on these huckleberries, <laughs> which is, I guess, yeah. what you do when yeah. you have all this free, <laughs> these free huckleberries everywhere. Yep. And so he uses this analogy to describe his prayer life, which is that prayer is a way of tapping into a reality that is all around us, but that is invisible unless we look for it. Mm. And so I guess... The analogy that he uses is the huckleberry, but then because he's Tim Mackey, he goes into the biblical narrative and all that sort of stuff Mm. and how when especially like Paul is talking about spiritual realities that are beyond the physical realm, there is a spiritual reality that is just as real as the physical one that we live with every day, but that most people don't even think about because it's invisible but that prayer is the way that we tap into and that we communicate with and that we can actually see change come about in the spiritual realm, which then affects the world of physical Mm. material objects. That was a tangent. I'm sorry. We're talking about the book. But I thought I'd mention it because, number one, Tim Mackey writes the foreword for this. He mentions it very briefly, very slightly. But then I think that for a lot of us, who are in our adulthood, who read a story like 13-year-old walking around a school praying, there's a sense of I'm not doing that, so I must be a failure. Mm. But Tim Mackey, he's in his 40s, I assume, late 30s, maybe 40s. He's a regular grown-up adult and as a, even as a biblical scholar, he says that this is something that he's struggled with. So I just want to say, Mm, if prayer is something that you've struggled with, just know that you're not alone and that even biblical scholars like Tim Mackey are in that same boat. Yeah, and I think it's a weird... I think like our church, there's a lot of weird preconceived preconceived ideas about prayer and sometimes it can feel like... I don't know. I I don't know if we always present prayer in the best way. It's either it's presented as a like it's just a thing you have to do or the other extreme is it's like this wild thing and you have to pray for four hours a day and whatever. Yeah. Like I just feel, I don't know. That's why I really appreciate this book. Cause it felt like actually like this is a prayer life that's for me. Like I can see how this would actually work in my life and maybe the effects of it and the and challenge me as well on the power, like on the power of it and stretching myself, but not to like ridiculous extremes. Yeah, I do think that, certain spiritual disciplines resonate with certain personalities more than others. You have your Pentecostal traditions where there's prophecy and speaking in tongues and that's huge and there are certain personalities that really gravitate toward that. And I think the same thing is true for prayer. I find there's two people, there's two types of people, two types of Christians generally, stereotypically with prayer. (laughs) There's the in your face, we have to set up a prayer ministry at our church and we have to be praying constantly and it's very intense and it's very 
high level. Mm. And that person may have an amazing spiritual life. That's great. But they don't always do a great job of selling that to everybody else. And then there's the other type of person who doesn't like to advertise so much, but they're very serious and very, I don't know what the word is. They take it very seriously, but Mm -hmm. they don't like to tell lots of other people Mm. about it, which again, personalities. But I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking you have to be one of the other types. You have to be a certain personality Mm. to be really a prayer person, somebody who's really engaged with the spiritual things. But I just, again, the book I think really does a great job of proving that's not true. You, yeah. you can be a normal person and there's there's richness and deepness that can be experienced in prayer that doesn't mean that you have to become a certain type of person. You can be you and have a, a great prayer life. Which I love. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, think, I, think that, I think you're hitting it there. A lot of the time we talk about prayer, it doesn't feel like me. Like it feels yeah. like I have to change who I am to be that kind of prayer warrior. And so it's just easier to just say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm just going to do the basics, yeah. you know, if that. Yeah. So- yeah, that's why I find this good. And I think each, for me, each chapter like hit a bit differently. And there were some mm. chapters where I'm like, I don't think I'm, I think I'm going to work on other things before I work on this. And some chapters where I'm like, I'm jumping on this like right now. Yes. Like even the very first story of him walking around his school every day, I was just like, man, some people might judge me for this because I'm a pastor. But it's like, how often am I, am I literally like just going through a list of people that I need to pray for and just praying for each of them by name? Often I'll be like, praying for my church and praying for a couple of people who I know have needs or whatever. But just, I was even thinking like, I've got this list of all of my my youth group because now mm. I'm like, I'm a youth pastor now. So I've like literally got all of their names on this list. And, and so I was just like, I don't know, like recently I've just been taking the time to just go through that list and just pray for each name. And I don't necessarily tell them all, maybe I should tell them, but like at the moment I'm not telling them all that I'm praying for them, but I'm just like, that's what I'm just making time to do, just praying for each of them and just trying to think through. And it like... Even that alone has felt like, I don't know what it's doing in them, Mm. but it just feels like that alone is probably having, I'm going to assume it's probably having more impact than the socials or whatever that I run. That's actually, it's interceding for them. And there's a whole chapter in the book about what what we call intercessory prayer. So it's like praying for someone else, praying in their place. And that alone has been like a real powerful impact for me. Yeah, just taking the time to do that. And I think about, man, imagine if I could convince my whole youth group to pray for their school by now. Everyone in there, like doing what Tyler did or like just even just praying for, imagine what would happen. Mm, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Or if all of our churches had somebody literally just going through a name of all the, the young people and just praying for Incredible. each one. Yeah, just, I don't know what the impact would be. And that's the point. This is That's when it's just yeah. going into God's realm. Like he's going to do it and we're just putting it into his hands. Being like, you know what, God, here are all of these names and we can we're going to do stuff. We're going to do our best. But ultimately, this is something you have to work on. And I think going back to that personality piece, th- there are certain people that are very spiritually attuned and mm. that's a, such a precious gift to have. Mm. Somebody who sees the spiritual movements, the waters moving mm. when other people don't. There are obviously some challenges in that. There are some people who see spiritual things maybe where there's not necessarily, but for the most part, I'm really thankful for those people. But there are those of us who maybe default to just the material world because Mm -hmm. that's what's in front of us. That's what we have to deal with every day. And so I think on the one hand, we shouldn't spiritualize everything, Mm. even though there is probably spirit, (laughs) Numa, in, in almost everything we do to a greater or a lesser degree. But on the other hand, I think that this book is potentially really good for those of us who sometimes forget and sometimes fail to recognize the the spirit and the way that the spiritual world is working in our material everyday life. Mm. Yeah, which is funny. That's like the <laughs> the basis of like the Adventist church. It's a, that's the great controversy. Know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. how funny is that? And yeah. it's like, I don't know. To be honest, I've, I, I used to really resist the idea of the great controversy because I just thought of like, it's just old school, you know, it's just like, it's yeah. the devil doing it, you know, like yeah. that's, that was the mindset I was in. <laughs> Not to like underrate it, but I just felt oh, this is just an old school way of viewing yeah, it. Yeah, it's, oh, I had traffic on the way to work. Ah, the devil did it. <laughs> <laughs> but as I'm like growing in my faith and maturing, I'm like, maybe there was something to that. Maybe yeah. there's actually truth. Maybe there really is a full on spiritual battle around 
everything. And that's not to, again, that's not to say that there is no physical element to it. But yeah, yeah it's, I guess it doesn't take much to cover yourself for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. To invite God into that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I just, I've been really challenged by that too. That's So again, this is one of those things that like made me think back. I'm like, that was a tradition I had in my denomination and in my, yeah, growing up. But now I'm maybe there was an element of truth to that. Mm. Yeah. Are there any specifics, Josh, that for those of us who are listening and might think, okay, maybe I want to pick this book up. What's some specifics that made you really resonated with you in the book? Because it does cover a wide range of things relating to prayer Mm. and we're at a pretty high level right now. So could we get down to some of the weeds? Yes. Let's do some weeding. (laughs) <laughs> okay. I was like, there's these moments with the podcast where Josh is like thinking of something and I'm like, what's he going to say now? <laughs> <laughs> I know you can see it in my eyes. Uh, you can see I'm about to lower everyone's IQ. All right. Now, one thing, Tyler spends a lot of time talking about the Lord's Prayer and he, at the end of the book, sets up this pattern of prayer, this daily rhythm of prayer. And in the morning, he'll go through the Lord's Prayer like every single day, not just recite it, but go through it conversationally. Like each line he'll use as a prompt to have a conversation with God and to listen to God. So not just saying like our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He'll say that and then he'll go through through some things about, Lord, you're holy, like you made everything, you are good, you're beautiful. Like he'll actually take time to hallow God's name. Yeah. And then give us our our daily bread and then we'll start listing things that he needs like whatever and i yeah got really into that i never thought i'd be into praying the same prayer every day but <laughs> yeah i found it super helpful i'll finish the pattern but yeah so he'll do lord's prayer in the morning in the middle of the day he'll do a prayer for the lost so then he'll just spend some time yeah praying for people who need to meet jesus and he talks about this in a really cool way he's often at lunch that's when a lot of us are at work. Right. And imagine just sitting in your office, having a bit of silent prayer time and looking around at all your co-workers and just seeing those who need Jesus. Mm. It's and not like an abstracted, it's actually there's people. Yeah, you're, you're, you're in the midst of it. You mm. know, you work at a school or whatever or, you know, in an office building or, yeah, whatever it is. Like that's a time when you're actually out and about with people and you can be like looking at people or like having a list with you and you're just praying over that, that list of people who you know they need to meet Jesus. And then at the end of the day, it's a prayer of gratitude, just going through the day and thanking God for everything through the day. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I found it, I, I don't know. I was always really resistant to doing anything anything repetitive in my spiritual life, if right. that makes sense. I think as Adventists, we're trained against that sort of sensibility or that sort of instinct to do the liturgical rep- repetition thing yeah yeah i felt i don't know we always talk a lot about liturgy is we talk about how catholic it is or whatever that's that was a mindset that i went into it with i was surprised at how much i how much i appreciated it and how helpful it was i wait there's this analogy give me one second i'm just gonna find it okay i was listening i think i heard this in a sermon from john tyson oh no or maybe it was in a book i can't remember yeah, anyway, maybe it, yeah, it might have been John Tyson or it might have been, I'm trying, I got it from one of two places. Anyway, <laughs> the other one is a book by, you know, that really smart dude and you wrote that book, A Non-Anxious Presence? No, sorry. <laughs> I don't know the book. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't expected to use this analogy, but it just popped into my head and That's I figured fine. now's That's a fine. good time. Mark Sayers. Oh, okay. Yeah, really smart dude. And the book, <laughs> Non-Anxious Presence is also, maybe we should do an episode on that book. Okay. It's really interesting. Anyway, they shared about this thing called the Oda Loop. It's a cycle developed by a military strategist um, <clears throat> that people would apply to combat operations. So ODA is that you observe, you decide, and you act. So they would just constantly go through this. So if you're like flying in a plane, you see a situation, observe, decide, and act. Okay. However, as um, things began to speed up, um, especially like once they got even faster planes... Uh, particularly like those like hectic jets that fly super fast, they were finding that just observing and then deciding and then acting wasn't enough because sometimes the planes and everything would be happening so fast that you'd be just completely disoriented and you wouldn't actually be sure of what you're observing. So they created the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, 
act. Oh. So it's taking a moment to observe and then recognize. So say you're flying a really fast jet, right? You can be flying and doing all of these maneuvers and whatever. And then you can look around and look at your controls and be like, oh, I need to pull up. And then you go to pull up, but you're actually upside down. Right. Because the plane's moving so fast, it's hard to tell. Yep. Right. So they would be like, you're flying your plane, you observe, you realize what you need to do. You realize that you're at the wrong level. Take a moment to orient yourself and make sure north is north, whatever, mm. up is up, mm. down is down, and then act and then decide and then act. Okay. And <clears throat> yeah, the comparison here is that having these daily rhythms as prayer is actually a moment to reorient yourself. I see. Yeah. So like every morning you take a moment, like this is what I found really helpful about doing this Lord's Prayer every morning. The first thing that I'm, I try and do it really early on, don't always nail it, that's life. <laughs> you get up and you take a moment to say, our father in heaven, hallowed is your name. It's like this instant moment where I feel reoriented and I'm like, mm. God is bigger than all of this. Mm-hmm. God is greater. And then just saying like, your kingdom come, your will be done. Like it's instantly, I feel reoriented because I'm like looking around and recognizing what's what's up, what's down, what's, what's forward, what's back, what's north, right. what's south. Right. And that's what I found helpful about having these Daily rhythms. Now, having these daily rhythms, A, look, sometimes I miss them, especially like a crazy day. I sometimes I miss the lunch one. Sometimes I'll be so tired I fall asleep before I do my gratitude prayer or whatever. Sometimes life is so crazy that I miss the morning one, whatever it is. But that's the thing. If you miss one, just try not to miss the next one. (laughs) But like the orientation has been amazing for me. I've felt like I have, yeah, I, I guess better direction in my life. And yeah, and it's not that all, that's not that those repetitive prayers it's not like that's all you do like i still have other prayers that i pray i'm a pastor i say grace for people all the time (laughs) no but i like have other prayers too and sometimes i mix it up if i'm just really feeling something else in my heart to pray for whatever like just go for it it's not about that but just having that thing that i can rely on every day that's going to reorient me is so helpful yeah i think that's good because as much as we don't like to do the repet um liturgical stuff i think a lot of people because they don't have that baseline maybe that's I know for me that's been a challenge in Mm. prayer is not having a baseline, not having somewhere to start, a starting point, Mm. a defined starting point. Okay, I don't know what to pray about today. I'll start with your holy God sort Mm. of thing or or whatever the case may be or whatever stage of the day you're at. Um, Often often the starting is, thank you, Lord, for this lovely day. And outside it could be like thundering and raining. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's just how we start because we don't know where else to start. That's right. That's right. (laughs) It's almost like the equivalent of talking about the weather with it's small talk. <laughs> yes, yeah. I don't know what to talk to you about, so I'm going to talk about the weather. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's great. The morning is the Lord's Prayer. The The middle of the day is talking, praying for the lost. And then the evening is... Gratitude. S- gratitude. Like just thanking right. God for things that have happened in the day. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's a good rhythm. Yeah, it's great. The gratitude one is awesome. Like I feel like at the end of the day, even if I've had a terrible day, I'm like, it's got to be something I've got to be be grateful for something. Like, And it forces me to think, God actually did do this. I feel like I'm seeing God moving more in my day because I'm consciously looking for ways to thank him that he's been moving. So the other thing that we wanted to touch on before we finish this episode is his section on silence. So Josh, let's just reflect on that. Okay. (laughs) All right, sorry. It was too easy. It was right there for the taking. Yeah, he had this section on silence and it was challenging for me. I'm an extrovert. Like silence is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was a challenge. I had to reread that chapter once or twice. And as well, I also heard Tim Mackey talk about it too. Mm. Side note, because he was talking about his prayer life and he's like his morning devotional time with God. He doesn't actually spend much time at least when he said this he wasn't spending much time reading his bible in the morning because his job is reading the bible yeah so much like immersed in it yeah and talking and so his morning devotion time he would just sit in silence listening for god and i'm like i can think of very little things more painful than sitting you know what i mean like (laughs) i know i'm meant to love it because i'm a pastor and whatever but i'm just like it's really hard for me to sit in silence and yeah there's this awesome quote from the book Prayer means the risk of facing silence when we're addicted to noise. Yeah, wow. It's the risk of facing a God we've mastered talking about, singing about, reading about, and learning about. It means risking real interaction with that God. And the longer we've gotten used to the settling for the noise around God, the higher the stakes. 
What if it's awkward and disappointing or boring? Or what if God stands me up altogether? Yeah, wow. I, I remember being really challenged through that chapter and I was just like, yes, like I'm sometimes I can be scared to sit in silence with God because I'm like, what if I don't hear anything? What if he doesn't mm. say anything? Does that, you know, like how does that challenge me? Yeah. And yeah, I'm still learning. Like I'm still, I wouldn't say, I don't know if there is a way to master prayer, but I don't think I've mastered this by any means. But just, I think the value of just like part of seeking God is sitting there and just giving him time to talk. Mm -hmm. And even if there's sometimes where maybe he needs me to be silent and he's just going to sit with me in it. Mm. Yeah. It's, that was a real, that was a real reshape for me and it's still something I'm working on, but yeah, that was a big challenge. Just that whole chapter about silence and and just persistence in in, in it. Yeah. Just like continuing to persist through the silence and being okay with it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, John Mark Comer talks about this as well in, I can't remember which book it was that he talked about it. It may have been Ruthless Elimination. Yeah, it's, I think it's, he talks about it as one of the spiritual disciplines in yeah. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Great book as well. Would Great also, book, yeah. yeah. And obviously there's a lot of intermingling between these two sort of leaders who are journeying and yes. working together. But yeah, John Mark Comer was the pastor of Bridgetown Church in Portland yeah. and he didn't want to be a lead pastor anymore he wanted to focus on his teaching and stuff which it's fair he's really good at it so yeah. he's like writing books and stuff yeah so yeah they did like probably one of the most flawless leadership hand handovers Crazy. i've ever seen yeah. yeah and so now tyler's the leader and it's going great by the looks of things i don't know if it's coma that references this but have you ever read screw tape letters c.s lewis i think so i maybe parts of it i don't know if yeah. i read the whole thing now that i think about it in it screw tape the demon refers to so there's two different kingdoms there's the kingdom of god mm -hmm. and then there's the kingdom of noise and mm. that's the aim of the demons to crowd out everybody's thoughts their lives their inner life and their outer life as well in immersing them in this kingdom of noise because mm. if they can succeed to do then there'll be no room for silence meditation spiritual gifts wow. and ultimately connection with god wow so that's the whole aim obviously this is a allegorical theological story mm. but i think that sums up so well those are the stakes that we're talking about here and again not to talk to different people with different sensibilities i still struggle with silence even though i'm an introvert i love silence my problem isn't being silent my problem is being immersed in my own thoughts mm. so for me it's letting go of my own what's going on in my head and allowing God's presence and his spirit to fill those that that space. Mm. So I think it's important for us to be compassionate on different people with different dispositions and also recognize even if it might be easier for some of us that we still have our own issues and our own things to work on in that discipline. Yeah. Yeah, it's so countercultural. Yeah. I think, is it Dallas Willard? Is it if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so it's so true. And it's the same with like noise. Yeah. I feel like if he can't stop you from talking to God, it'll just crowd, crowd, crowd it out like with so much other sound. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's, I think, yeah, that, that's really it. We're addicted to noise. And so that for me was a super challenging chapter. And like he talks about Jesus, how he would often retreat away to, yeah, to quiet places by himself, which, I'm like, he's like the, he's literally the son of God and he needed to do it. So <laughs> I a, probably also need to do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Very <laughs> good know, point. Like, yeah. I'm like, who, like who else would have a better connection with the father than Jesus himself? Yeah. And even he needed to go and take time to be silent. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, for sure. Yeah, that's fair. It's a yeah. good argument. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably going to do it for this episode. Again, this is not a substitute for reading the book. If prayer is something that you have struggled with as we have, we can both wholeheartedly recommend the book. It's a cheap book and it's a, an easy read and I think that it's well worth it. Yeah, you do it. A physical book, Kindle, yeah. Audible, whatever. And so, yeah, would strongly encourage you guys to, to read it as well as Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by... John Mark Comer, both great books and a really, I think just really hitting where we're at culturally. Yeah. So 
yeah, shorter episode today. That's all we wanted to share. So yeah, if you guys have read it or if you read it after this, um, reach out. We'd love to hear your thoughts um, or even just where you're at with prayer. Um, yeah, just it's such a massive topic. There's probably some, we could probably do a bunch of episodes on prayer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd just love to hear some of your thoughts here where you guys are at um, and yeah, what you think of it if you've read the book. Hmm, definitely. All right. If you haven't already, we'd love it if you would uh, connect with us in any way you can. You can send us an email at burnthehaystack at podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can connect to us on social media, on our Facebook page, Instagram, and our Facebook group. Mm. Uh, if you want to join our group and join the discussion, that's usually where most of our in-depth discussions happen, either suggestions for future episodes or reflections on past episodes. And if you are enjoying the content, again, leave us a rating or review on your podcaster podcasting app of choice. Apple Podcast tends to be where it's at mostly. So if you wouldn't mind leaving us a five-star review or a one-star if you really want to. <laughs> uh, yeah. But we'd really appreciate a five-star. <laughs> yeah, five stars are great, but be honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does really help. But apart from that, thank you all for listening. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Stay awesome. That is Josh and Jesse. Out!